You know, we, we're caught up in a mind game. Mm -hmm. And as long as they have us reactionary, we can never be proactionary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Listen, it wouldn't have made a difference if Hillary Clinton became the president. Yeah, yeah. Nope. It wouldn't have made a difference to me if Barack Obama had been given a third term. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have been it wouldn't have made a difference to me who is in the presidency. If we're on our if we're on our A game doing what we're supposed to do, and this is what I say to us as a people. Harriet Tubman is my hero. Mm -hmm. She's my yes. I pray to sister every morning that I get up. And this is what I say. Do you think that Harriet Tubman ever worried about who was president of the United no, States not when all. she was on the Underground Railroad? Not at all. Do you, do you ever think she ever thought that somebody in the White House was going to make her job a little bit easier? No. No. Then that's what I say to us. That's how I think. It doesn't make a difference right. who's there. I'm going to do this. This is my thing. Yes. My question is, what is your thing? What is your contribution? and have no fear for atomic energy. Because atomic energy is them. As you can see, there's explosions all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, have no fear for that. Because they're tumbling out of control, as you can see. Absolutely. They're tumbling out of control. Yep. And it took a little bit of a while, but Marcus Garvey told us this. Yes. That's right. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us this. Malcolm taught us that chickens are going to come home to roost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's been happening because from, from 1492 on, when, whenever you set up anything, and this is why we have to be careful, not to start to act like them. Yeah. That becomes very important because when you start acting like those who did to you, when you start feeling the way they feel, mm -hmm. then you begin to be entrapped in the same problem that they're entrapped in. Okay, somebody throws you in a pit, you can spend your time complaining about who threw you in the pit, or you can spend your time climbing out of the pit. And I'd rather spend my energy getting out of the pit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than getting caught up cursing the person that threw me in. And when I get back up on ground, when I get things beautiful and glorious as a civilization that they were building, mm -hmm. and then they were cold cop, we call it cold cop, when someone mm -hmm. hits you without you being aware, mm -hmm. okay, and threw us in a pit. But we were heading somewhere, they weren't. Mm -hmm. They still ain't. And, and, and they're still not. Because they're still tripping over the same thing. If, if, if we as a human, you know, I, I, you know, I get into a lot of cosmology and astronomy and things like that, and I wonder sometimes if a force from another galaxy mm -hmm. came down and observed us, watched how we're acting, I'm talking about we as human beings on the planet, if they, let's say our, our civilization goes back millions of years, but let's say that their existence goes back 200 million years. Let's say that they are on the higher levels of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they come down and they look at us and how we're acting. And they're saying, but they're all the same people. They're, there's only one race of them out there. But they're fighting each other like there are differences really amongst them where it's only superficial. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to roll back this skin, mm -hmm. we all look alike. You know, they, you know, they have an um, advertisement somewhere where you see two hands that are holding, their skeletal hands, but as it comes up, you can see the arms, and one of them is a person of pigmentation, and another is of less pigmentation, the person of European descent. So what the advertisement is saying is that, you know, when you get to the skeleton, we all look alike. Mm -hmm. and, and I would even dare say, when you get beyond the epidermis, we all look alike. Yet we're conducting ourselves like there's actually, like, like I tell folks, there's no such thing as an interracial marriage. Because there's only one race. Right. So to have a concept of an interracial marriage means that there's more than one race that's inter. You can have an intraracial and an intercultural relationship. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the Moors, I'm, I'm going to say some things that might make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. But the reality of it is, is that if we are going to look at this and do what we have to do, we have to be very honest with ourselves. Uh, 
and, and, and look at it for real, clear. But the questions that you ask is probably one of the most important questions as it relates to how we talk to our children. Because so many of my children that I've had throughout my career ask me the same question. Because when you're talking about how wonderful Africa has been and all that it's done, when you talk about its military might, its Nubian warriors, they say, but who was all that? How did we get like this? And the bottom line to all this is we fight amongst ourselves. Hmm. Everywhere that I see our history, from Kemet to the Moors to the plantation <coughs> to the election of 2016, we fight amongst ourselves. We are a personality oriented people, and as opposed to an issue oriented people. I work with people who can't stand me. And honestly, I don't care for that. <laughs> but it wasn't about our feelings towards each other. It was about the job that we had to get done. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. There were times I had to take directions from them. Mm -hmm. And I obeyed them. There were times I had to give directions to them. And they obeyed me. Because what, whatever we felt towards each other, we were able to leave that at the door before we came in. Mm -hmm. And we became issue-oriented. We fight amongst ourselves. You see, and here's why. Dr. Edwin Nichols, brilliant scholar, talks about um, the two major things that drive the human, okay, is the need to survive and the need to thrive. Survive and thrive. There is one thing that Eurasians have that is very powerful and has come into existence because of their existence. They have a keen sense of survival. We lack that because we have always been around. And we also know that we will always survive. We may be living in hell during the survival, but we know we'll always be around. If we go, everybody goes. That's right. That's right. Ain't nobody going. Right. We and the cockroaches are here to stay. <laughs> you see, they have not. This <coughs> up, uh, but the idea is is that we have to begin to understand where we are as a people, and we have to come together and be and begin to develop an understanding of what it is that we have to. And we'll keep talking about this as as, as we go on because we want Egypt had done all the footwork first, so. Dr. Van Sertema knew where to take us, mm -hmm. to Palenque, to see those stone heads, mm -hmm. uh, to museums, to Alexander Von Wootenow's studio, That's right. where he chronicled over 60,000 artifacts that, mm -hmm. that demonstrated the African presence in America. Because it's not just the stone heads and the pyramids that you, you, you should focus on. Mm -hmm. It's the little things that are day-by-day -day things that show you where Africans were, mm -hmm. vessels that they used, uh, goblets that they drank from incense burners that they may have had. These are all evidences of a people that are living there. Okay, um, the, the idea of having uh, like certain shells or, or, or bones of animals that you're only going to find in Africa, like hippopotamus. You know, when they make something out of hippopotamus bone, well, there are no hippopotamuses, hippopotami in America. So you have to ask yourself, well, where did that bone come from? And when it's, when it's chiseled into a, a, a pipe or into something, you have to figure that they purposely carved it from that bone and they had to have known the bone and been familiar with the bone to do what they did. Mm -hmm. So these are the psychological concepts that we have to bring into our thinking mm -hmm. so that when we're standing up and talking to people that they don't give you the okie doke. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why, you know, like I tell folk that I'm not invited to many things. The last thing I was invited to <laughs> was at the Hall of Science. Yes. And in the Hall of Science, I did something on the Shabaka Stone, which is the African uh, coming into being of the universe. And I was dropping all this information down. I was showing them all these books. I was showing them all these other kind of things, which may be a later presentation series we can do. But uh, it took me three months to get paid. Wow. <laughs> I guess I, I should have known they weren't going to invite me back no time soon. But... When you approach things scientifically is what I'm really getting at, not anger, mm -hmm. not emotion. This is science. 
they, they don't want you around. Because if they can get you angry, then you're in their ballpark. Mm -hmm. And they will win through that anger and through yes. that emotion. Yes. But when you apply passion to science, and you can demonstrate, mm -hmm. as we will go through this series, and one of the first things that I wanted to do, do, uh, do, uh, do I need to talk into the microphone? No, I'm good. You're good? Yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> Uh, everybody but, back here can hear? Well, but uh, basically, um, who is that this piece that I shared with you? This is the syllabus. This is the outline for the class. And basically, the uh, description is, is Africans in medieval Europe will, in, uh, will include, this class will include the exploration of concepts in African and European civilizations. Presentations will include the research on settlements and subsequent movement of African people into southern Spain in 710. To their defeat of the last recorded African ruler, Boabdil in Granada in Spain on January 2nd, 1492. And then class six will examine the lasting impact Africans had on Europe and the expansion of Moorish culture. We'll look at people such as uh, uh, Alexander Dumas, the grandfather, the father, and the grandson. Uh, we'll, we'll look at people such as uh, Alexander Pushkin, Beethoven, uh, George Bridgetower, who was, a, who, who was a mentee, who was a student of Ludwig von Beethoven. So we're going to look at the lasting impact that Africans had on Europe. Um, and so the book list I've given you, The Golden Age of the Moor, and the African presence of early Europe. Now, as you're reading them, what you're going to see is that uh, in, in terms of the um, reading, I put in abbreviation APEE, -E, which means the African presence in early Europe. So you'll know what book I'm referencing. Mm -hmm. GAM is the golden age of the Moor. And then the initials in front of the essay tells you what essay you should read for that particular piece. So today's class is going to be uh, race and origins <coughs> in, in early Europe, but the question becomes how did human life originate in Africa and migrate to Europe? The, 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 the reason why I put questions or uh, statements, you, you, you could have a class statement or a class question is because as an educator, I want you to know what I'm hoping you can answer. And if I do this class and you do the reading and you can't answer that question, then there's somewhere that we have to catch up. Where we have to figure out what do we have to do in order for you to be able to answer that question. So at the end of this class, for me it's important that you understand, basically, how did human life originate in Africa? Because we say it. But what, what were the reasons for it? Scientifically, geographically, historically, wh where's the evidence of it? And again, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that when you look up here and you see me, I want you to see you. Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm charging you with going back into your community. Go, go into your homes, into your friends' homes, into the things that you do and share this information. Of course, to the people that are here. Because, <laughs> you know, it's a lonely world when you know the truth, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Common sense ain't that common. <coughs> and so then the second class is something that I'm, I'm, I'm going to combine uh, the ancient Mediterranean Isles and mainland Greece, but I also want to show you a part of North Africa. I want to go into the kingdoms of Carthage and Numidia in North Africa. Because when you understand what was happening, give or take about two, three hundred BC in North Africa, when you understand things dealing with the Phoenicians, See, these are all missing parts of history that we don't get uh, in, in touch with, so there, there, there are always lingering questions that are asked that we can't answer, not because the answers aren't there, but because it's called episodic history. Episodic history is when you take episodes in history and you study them. But when you study it in continuity, in relationship to each other, then every step you take, you take knowing the step you took before. 
And so that's why we start with the origin of life in Africa. You can't understand the Moors if you don't understand how life originated in Africa. Because a lot of what they're going to accomplish are going to come directly out of all of the different uh, kingdoms and nations that came from the very beginning of time. So I want you to not only understand, you see, there is no such thing as Greece. When people are saying Greek civilization did this and did that, they were not calling themselves Greeks. It didn't exist. It's an illusion that they've created that's become a reality when they say Greece. You're talking about a Mediterranean basin. You're, you're, you're talking about parts of Italy and Greece, Sardinia. You're talking about the islands of Crete. Okay, you're, you're coming up around uh, the, the, the um, west coast of Turkey, which in the ancient world was called Anatolia. You're, you're coming around Turkey, and you're, you're coming into the northern part of Africa, what today would be called, what today is called Israel. Yesterday it was called Cana. Okay. We, we get lost in that. It comes into North Africa, and then it comes around. There's a basin. If you, if you just look at the Mediterranean Sea, look at all the land that's on the coast, all around that. That was all Cushite. That was all African. And then you have Europeans coming down in waves from the northern part of the world, having experienced the Ice Age, and they're coming down and they're mingling with these people. Long before the Romans were in Italy, they were the Etruscans. The Etruscans are black. <coughs> okay, and these Euro Europeans are going to inhabit these mountainous areas known as Latium. And out of Latium is going to come the word Latin. But these are Germanic people. These are people coming from Germany, uh, Norway, Sweden, coming from the northern region. They have been impacted by the Ice Age. They're going to come down into this region and they're going to meet black people. <coughs> and people such as Iamblichus and Pythagoras is, is going to be told by the Kushites there, look, you know, you're pretty slick, you're pretty smart, but if you want to get smarter, you've got to go to Egypt. Because mm -hmm. that's where the fountain of knowledge and wisdom is. And so Pythagoras is going to go there. But they're not going to let him into school for 22 years. They say, you're not right. And his name wasn't Pythagoras, it was Patagora. Mm. But again, that's all that we do that becomes an illusion in our understanding. Mm. And it comes down to language again. Always comes down to language. And that's why the brother's book is so important to understand how language is framed. Mm. You know, what is an adjective? What is an adverb? Because mm -hmm. when you understand that, you have to understand that there's no... Amen doesn't mean so be it. It can't mean it. Because so be it is a sentence. It be so. You know, you, you, you've got a subject, a verb, and an adverb. It be so. So then you go back into the Latin language, you look up the verbs, you look up the language, and you come to realize, well, it can't mean it be so. It be so in Latin doesn't mean amen. But then when you go to amen, what do you do? You go back to commit, and amen means the hidden waters. The hidden fertile waters. That's part of the Shabaka stone. This is our history. But we have to approach it in a way that we get the, 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 the paralysis out of the analysis. And so that we can get this done. We can understand this and teach our children so that they can take their rightful place. Because this ain't just about knowing this. This is dead history if you just want to know it. When, when you see what the Moors did in science and in, in, and in education, that's what I want to do. I want to go back to those days. You talk about make America great again. <laughs> I want to make America Moorish again. <laughs> so that's what we'll do class two. Class three, we're going to get right into the Moorish dynasties and Al-Andalus. Al-Andalus. Al and the question becomes, who are the Moors? Where did the Moors come from? And then we also will look at, that's, that's the prehistory. We'll, we'll look at who they were as a people, known as the, the, the ancient Moors were known as the Garamantes. G-A-R-A-M-A-N-T-E-S, Garamantes, and, and that essay that I, I shared with you, the African heritage slash ethno history of the Moors for class three is 
is going to give you a good sense of who these individuals were, who these human beings were. That, that, that that's actually going. G A R A, Garamantes. M A N T E S. Garamantes. There's a a, a, a wonderful uh, sister did a wonderful uh, Dana Reynolds did a phenomenal essay mm -hmm. talking about uh, this uh, these people and and what they did. These are going to be the people who are going to travel the the, the Nile, the Hopi Valley, and are and are going to people the Hopi Valley, going to find themselves in this part of the world, and then they'll be sweeping over into the West, and they they will become the future West Africans, people that we know today as the Ifa. And, and, and the Dogon, uh, the Tukalor, um, uh, the Bambada, the Senegalese. These are all the people that are going to flow over, coming up the Nile Valley and then going west and peopling Africa. There's a chapter, I, I didn't put it here, but there's a chapter in Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop's book, Myth of Reality, uh, chapter 10. It's called The Peopling of West Africa from the Nile Valley. Where he, In fact, I'm going to show you a map of how it happened. Uh, but that's going to be class three. That's March 18th. Uh, April 15th, we're, we're going to do a combined class on on the African education in Moorish Spain. You know, to understand what Africans did going into <coughs> Europe, where there were no libraries, there were no educational institutions. Kings and queens lived in barns <laughs> with the animals. Uh -huh. Hence, we have the chicken pox and the German measles. Africans went and went up in there and said, yo, listen. We have the expert here right now. Oh, for now. We have the expert. Say, uh, uh, listen, y'all got to create a place for them cows and the animals. And so they created what's known in Ethiopia is called Kral, K-R-A-L. It's now, now it's a corral where you corral your animal. You don't let them in and up out of your house. <laughs> <laughs> they out there, you in here. Okay. <laughs> Separate yourselves. They still doing it. Well, that's they, they, but, but yes, still. They still doing it. Can't help you. Still, but you see, this this is a manner of and and again, they they are products of their environment. You know, and and you know, we laugh and there's points of humor, but you can only be as great as your environment. And so when you are living in a very hostile environment, everything that has warm blood will make you warm so you will hug up on that land or the sheep or the dog because that will give off heat. So that it's important to understand that you are a product of your environment. If your environment, your nature around you is angry and hostile, jealous and envy, then your God is going to be angry and jealous and envious and will punish you for the slightest thing. But if you're living in a wonderful tropical climate where the, where, where the nature around you will supply you with your food, mm -hmm. then you're willing to share your food because you know the Creator, for you giving that mango to someone else, the Creator is probably going to give you three mangoes and probably do something real nice wherever He dropped that mango seed. So you create, you create your psychology around your environment. And so in a very warm tropical climate, you have a very loving, a very giving, a very trusting, which brother goes back to uh, something that, that, that he asked about how do we get here. Because when they came upon us, we sort of kind of thought they were like us. That, yeah, okay, I'll share this with you. But we didn't realize that for, for every three mangoes that they did, they were in the back of their mind saying, we, we, we definitely have to refrigerate this and we're going to take them all. <laughs> we're going to take the whole tree. The, the African concept is that you eat what you're hungry for. Right. Native Americans never hunted for sport. They hunted for life. So if one bison or one buffalo would feed them, would clothe them, would create bandages, then that's what they did. They didn't have an idea of putting a bison's head up on their wall to prove that, look what I killed. It's a whole different psychology. And, that, and that's what we're dealing with now. You're dealing with a people who killed for sport, who hurt for enjoyment. And so, class four will also go into um, <coughs> more science. We're, we're going to talk about science and the science that they brought in. Uh, there's, there's really a great uh, article in um, 
the golden age of the Moor, Cairo, Science Academy of the Middle Ages. And there's another one that Dr. Van Sotoma wrote called The Egyptian Precursor to Greek and Arab Science. <laughs> really good piece of writing. Class number five, May 20th, we're going to look at the music of the Moors and, and, and the role that the Moors played with music. The first musical conservatory was brought into Europe by Moors. Yep. Classical. Mm -hmm. All of that. What, what, what Africans yeah. did is that they took the xylophone, the kalimba, which is the finger piano, and the harp. Mm -hmm. What they did is turn the harp sideways, encase it in wood, and yeah, no. practice the kalimba, and that became the piano. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody in Europe playing piano in 400 AD. <laughs> it did not exist. And the music that they did play came from the harp, which was introduced to them through Africa. <clears throat> People say, you know, every time you talk, you know, you, you just, it, it's, it's all about Africa. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> It is, and if you had any sense, you'd know you're African too. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm saying something about you that is not part of your historical knowledge. It's that you have separated yourself from the human family. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jacob Carruthers calls it the philosophy of alienation, mm -hmm. where the Western civilization has separated themselves from nature. They see themselves as something other than in nature. So therefore, they are in battle with nature. Whereas when you deal with the African concept, we are nature. So that the idea is, is that you don't battle something that you are, you just find a way to manipulate and take it to the highest level. Mm -hmm. So you become one with nature. Michael Jordan, what allowed him to go up so high and stay up so long was he became nature. <coughs> and who's to tell gravity what gravity can do? Right. You see, and when you get to such a point, such a passion in what you do, you can almost become one with that thing that you're doing. So it makes it seem easy when you see our dancers and our singers and the, and, and, and the way they just get up into all these different types. You, you wonder, I mean, what a phenomenal um, way that they dance, but actually they become one with nature. They become part of the air. Mm. So when you see Michael George, uh, uh, Jackson or you see Chris Brown or you see any of the dancers, they don't say or any of them doing what they're doing, what they're actually doing is that they're allowing their molecules to become part of the air around them and that's what allows them to do what they do. And I'm saying to us that we can do the same thing in the classroom and do that with our brain. It's not just about sports and entertainment. While that is a wonderful way and is a wonderful way that we've expressed ourselves, but the same thing that made the Williams sisters do what they did and Tiger Woods do what he did and Jackie Robinson do what he did is the same thing that can allow our young scholars to do what they need to do in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. We just got to apply the neuromelanin to our thinking process and go back to thinking the way African people thought because we're not thinking like our ancestors thought. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a very serious challenge. But I you can't blame us. You know, we worried about paying our rent. <laughs> you know, we're worried about putting food on our table. We're worried about, is my grandbaby safe in the street? Mm -hmm. And when you're living under those conditions psychologically, your neurons are not allowed to connect the way they do, but you don't ever have to worry about where your next meal is coming from because you know you're going to eat. Somebody going to feed you, if not you. You're not worried about where you're going to sleep tonight. You're not worried about someone taking your home from you because in African communities, they never... These were no, no issues. So their neurons were allowed to connect in ways that were phenomenal, which allowed them to think on levels that we can as long as we're being blocked by our everyday struggle for life and fear about who's in the White House. Have no fear for atomic energy. Don't worry about that. Let that handle itself. The question is, you do you. You push on with what you're doing. Is there a musical legacy in Europe? Uh, in Europe? You know what you do sometimes? <clears throat> Take Beethoven. Take any of Beethoven's pieces. Furry Lease or, or Moonlight Sonata. And then play something by Thelonious Monk or Oscar Peterson. 
Play them simultaneous. And you'll see how similar they are. In fact, they accused Beethoven of doing to music back in the 1700s what they accused Thelonious Monk of doing and Oscar Peterson doing to jazz in the 20th century. They, 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 they said, you are sensualizing it. You see, and, and that's what, when you play and you go off into another world. You know, we'll tell the story about Beethoven uh, and, and how he did what he did. But improvise. Im improvise is something that is spiritual. It, 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 it has nothing to do with the notes on the page. Mm. In fact, you use the notes on the page like a, like a meditator uses a mantra. A mantra is meant to take you someplace. The notes on the page will, are only written because the people who wrote them are afraid they'll forget them. But Thelonious Monk never played the same piece twice. He always did it different. And he had to because that was his thing. That was his flavor. If you notice, all of us, we do the same exact thing. I could, give, I could give 20 young brothers a hat in this room, and every one of them would wear it different. Mm -hmm. Some would turn it this way, some would turn it backwards, some would put it on the back of their head, some would leave the label on, mm -hmm. some, would, yeah. <laughs> some would crush it and put it on, <laughs> because that's our flavor. Mm -hmm. And that's something that they don't like, that's why they banned you know, uh, people from doing like, like, like Bolt, you know, they, they banned him from going like that because they knew that when he went like that, that gave him power. Mm. He wasn't trying to say he was better than everybody else. He was just saying, I'm good. Amen. And, and we have never had a problem with that. And we have never had a problem admiring people who are like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's part of our problem because some of us admire the wrong people. But the idea is, that's our flavor, that's who we are. Celebrate that, okay? Brothers and sisters, sisters now I notice are, we're bringing, and I don't even know what natural means. Because, you know, like, what's the other thing? You know, people say, well that's, she, her, her hair's natural. Well, you, you, European women don't do nothing to their hair, they don't call that natural. You know, uh, in the summertime, you know, they have a word for kinky. It's called frizzy. They have frizz control. No, it's kink control. <laughs> because even European hair goes very curly in the hot weather. They're having a bad hair day. Mm. No, you're having a very good hair day. <laughs> you just are living in a bad world and you don't realize. So, that last class on June 17th is going to wrap all this up and we'll start looking at some some things that deal with it. The uh, other screen is on back there? Yes. Beautiful. Oh, wow. We got it down. Family, we're going to have a good time. I know. We're going to have a very good time. Yes, we are. Okay. This is mine. What? This is mine. Yeah. yeah. It works. Okay, what I want to do, I don't want to play around too much with this. You okay? You, you all right? You, you sit in the corner. Hold on. Everything is all right. way to understand how human life came to our planet if we don't understand the cosmos. I always begin my classes with the cosmos, but because of time and because of what I'd have to do, I'm going to leave that piece alone for now, and that deals with the Shabaka stone, but what I want to do is I want to talk about astronomers, astrophysicists say that our, our universe, our, cosmo, our cosmic universe has existed basically for 12 million years. Uh, 12 billion years. 12 billion years. 12 billion years. And that when you break it down into a calendar form, it, it, uh, uh, we'll, 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 
just saying is that the cosmic year, if you broke it down into 12 months, and every month was 1 billion years, our Earth would not exist until September 14th. <coughs> now that becomes very important because to Africans, we have always been around. Science says that energy can, cannot be created or destroyed. So therefore, the essence of who we are, this is the African philosophy, this comes out of Shabakistan. The essence of who we are has always been around and will always be around. That there is no such thing as afterlife. It's just another version of your eternal life. And it's like a living in a temple. They call it, you know, what 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 we call the the eter uh, the the uh, temple of eternity, where it's like you're in the house, but you're going through different rooms. Mm. And the doorway of what we call life is a doorway that you come out of the cosmos and you cross through that doorway, which is conception. When mommy and daddy were together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they created you, that conception mm -hmm. was the doorway. Mm -hmm. The moment you were conceived, you were in the other room. <laughs> wow. 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 Okay, and you started walking through yes. that room, yes. and that's your life. Yes. And then you get to the next room, that doorway is what we call death. Mm -hmm. uh, after death, you then move on into the next room. Mm -hmm. So there's no afterlife. There's no before life. There's just eternal life and various phases and versions of that life. Please. Can I say this? Um, what do it mean in terms like uh, you've seen something like we say like, we're in this room right now. Yes. And it's like I've seen this before, but yes. Can you say that it was another time or another Deja door? Vu, Deja vu, so to speak. But, yeah, but is that like what you're saying? Like we're going to another door, another time, okay. or okay. maybe? I mean, that say, could that be? Could that be something to say? I mean, like... Well, let, let me say it like this. Let's say you wrote a book, and then you read the book. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you came upon a thing you say, Wow, I, re wow, I remember this. Yeah. Well, yeah, you should. You wrote it. Okay. So, what... Deja vu... Okay. <laughs> One of our challenges. Now, please feel free to ask any question. You know, yes. we, you know, you know, it's cool yes. because I want this to be interactive. This, this is yes. no like lecture and then question and answer period. So yes. feel free to uh, to engage. Uh, when when you are, we as a human family have potential. We ha have been put upon by a people who don't have the potential of the original human beings. Mm -hmm. They have been impacted by an ice age which has calcified their pineal gland, which is the seat of their spirituality. Mm -hmm. And they live in three dimensions, height, width, and depth. Everything they judge is height, width, and depth. The original human beings lived in six dimensions. They had the height, width, and depth, but height, width, and depth led them to space and time, a space-time continuum. Space is geography, where you are. Time is history, when you are. In my research, to me, this is a Kaaba thought, it is possible to have a space-time continuum where there is no place and there is no time, there is just you existing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, your deja vu concept is merely a manifestation of what you've always been. Something happened. No, it's back. Oh, wait, wait. It's like when you're moving. Is that, is that me? It's short. Okay. Each and every one of us is light. And the sixth dimension is gravity, which holds us to where we are. Gravity is a curve in, 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 in space. So that deja vu 
is a is is a very possible experience because you've already been there. The past, the present, and the future is all the same time. You're right in the right, same right time. The same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you have to understand and know it. And as Africans, we understood this and we celebrated it. We're, we're, we're living in a world that if you told that to somebody, like, see, see, like, I don't talk like that around a lot of people. Like, as Corey, like, I, like, I'm in some group, I never ask people, did you hear that? <laughs> because I hear things they don't hear. Yeah, that's true. Because I got heavy dosages okay. of melanin in my inner ear. Okay. <laughs> And then, they, and then I don't say, did you see that? No, you don't tell them that. Because then you're crazy. No, I'm not crazy. It's just that I got a lot of melanin in my eyes. I see things they don't see. And I know we get all caught up in wanting to, you know, show people how great we are. And, I, and, and I'm with that. But there are some people, ain't, you know, they ain't ready for that. But your melanin, which is another concept that we need to study, has a has a it plays a very important part in this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank Make you. sense. Make a lot of it sense. Does. Does that, a lot of sense. Sorry. Does that like I notice a lot sometimes, and this is since I was a little girl. I would dream something, and then it happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like um, I'll give you a quick example. I was working at the Renaissance Hotel here, and I dreamt that the girl came to me and told me that she was promoted so I do this a lot I went to her and I said oh my gosh congratulations and she's looking at me like what are you talking about so she pulled me to the side and she's like Veronica what are you talking about I said didn't you just get promoted to lead um, lead officer or whatever it was at that time she was just like but I didn't tell anybody that wow. See? I didn't tell any I said are you sure I said I know you told me this she's like no she's like I've been gone for two weeks I actually found out maybe two or three days ago and this, this, like this, has been since I've been a little girl. When you look at science and you look at neuroscience and you look at neurons and neural melanin, the question becomes: What part of your dream is not your waking state, and what part of your waking state isn't your dream? You see, we're we're living in a world that it should scare you. But if you were in an African world, it would invigorate you. It, it would excite you. It, it would prepare you for whatever's going to happen. But we're, but we're living in a world that just, they're not prepared for us. They're not prepared for this because remember, their, their experiences has, has really been in the ice and a lot of their spiritual dimensions has been dulled by that and they lost their gravity, they lost their light and they lost their time-space continuum and now they can only deal with width, depth and height. We as African people, we, what we're going through and what our children are going through is like whales living in goldfish bowls. It, it's smothering us. It, it's not giving us the oxygen that we need. And this is what we suffer from. And out of this comes why we would shoot each other and why we would kill each other, why we would murder each other, why we would commit suicide, why we as men and women cannot get along, why we disrespect each other. All of that comes from this smothering of the truest sense of our spiritual abilities and who we are as a people. Mm -hmm. So what's important about this? A couple things. Number one is that the earth did not exist <coughs> until September 4th. Now if that be true, it means that we actually existed for a very long time. However, we had not come to this part of this existence yet. Our earth Chemites called Geb came into existence what would be eight and a half billion years after the first Big Bang. Okay? Now, with that, and oh, by the way, human beings, hu human beings as, as, as we know them, we have to break down to the month of December. Because everything is happening so quickly. The human ancestors living in Africa would not have appeared until December 30th. Think of a whole year. Human beings did not come into existence until what we call the Miocene period. 14 to 25 million years ago. Which would have been the 30th. We went through the age of the fishes, age of the mammals, 
age of the reptiles. Now, the pyramid builders, the people who started to bury their dead, the people who started making jewelry, the people who started doing great things, would not start doing that until the last 10 seconds of the last minute of the last hour of the last day. So you see how, it, I'm trying to show you how expansive this existence is before we even start talking about life coming out of Africa. So we have to get into astronomy, which is where so many of our scholars have said, we've got to go before we can even talk about who we are today. You know when that ball is at, on, on New Year's Eve, when the ball is up there and it starts to come down? That's when human consciousness came to the earth. The last 10 seconds of the last minute of the last hour of the last day. That's who the pyramid builders were. Wow. Wow. Mm. That's who the people, and there were no Europeans on the planet at this time. It was only African people at this time. Mm. Can you imagine that? See, see that, this is where I want to take you before we go where we need to get. To go back this far. And, and to look at walking through what I call corrective history or history that is, has a continuity to it. Not an episodic history. Not taking episodes out and examining them but follow each one to see how this came into existence. So here, you're, you're, you're going to have the human being coming into existence in Africa. But now what is very important to understand is that you have something that when there was a war between the water and the earth, when the earth came into existence, it was a gaseous ball. And it being a gaseous ball in the, in, in the interstellar cooling of the... Of the area that the earth was in after being thrown from the sun it, it was the third planet from the sun and it uh, was a gaseous ball but it cooled down and what happened in the core of the earth it started to harden which we call the core in this core and in this area in its cooling of the heat it's going to have eruptions volcanoes earthquakes and it's going to spew out from the core, these physical, let's call it land. But then this, the, 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 the water is going to take it over again. There's going to be another one going to come up. The water is going to take it over again. But there's one that's going to come up. The hill is going to rise up out of the water and it's going to stay above the water. That's Pangea. That's the hill, the original hill. What time? Pata, that's exactly who Pata is. The, the, the original hill that came up out of the waters of Nun. Okay, now you're going to have it up here. Right? And it, the, the water's not going to be, to be able to take it. But the reason why Africa becomes so important is because at the tip of the hill, at the top of the hill, in the middle of the hill, that is going to receive most of the light and heat energy of the sun longer than any other part, any other continent, is going to be Africa. Mm. And it's going to be the Great Lakes region. It's going to be the countries that we today call Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Congo, and Southern Africa. That's going to be the tip of the hill. That's why life is going to come from there. Okay, now mind you, we're not talking about complexion. We're not talking about pigmentation. This is science. And the sunlight is going to hit this area. Look at Pangea. Here's another version of Pangaea as it relates to the, uh, to the continents and countries of today. You see South America? Mm -hmm. Over here, the United States, there's Mexico, here's Africa, okay, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Spain, this is the Pangaea. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of this, right here, that's the top of the hill. That's the top of the hill that's going to receive direct and powerful light and heat energy. Every animal that exists on the planet has its origins there. Every fish, every fowl, every plant has its origins there. It's not that there are different variations of that plant. Even the dog there's a wild dog in Africa that is the first dog on the planet. 
They say, you're always talking about Africa. Hmm? Well, that's all there is to talk about. I didn't realize how big it was. <laughs> how? How big Africa was when it's oh, yes. events like that, because the map that they use, yes. it makes it look so small. Yes, have you, have, 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 have you ever seen the Peter's projection map before? No. Okay, that's what, this map right here, the Peters projection map, I, I, I introduced to my district in, in the Bronx, and it just, because the map we use is called the Mercator map. Mercator map, mercantilism came from the Mercator. This map was, was created by a man by the name of Arno Peters, who was a cartographer. Uh, map, map. map. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <coughs> He took the, the pictures taken from outer space. So this actually, the Mercator map is done by calculations. Mm -hmm. The Peter's projection map is photographs. Okay. This is what the continents look like. Uh, mm. Mm. Wow. <coughs> Peter's projection map. You can go to Friendship Press and you can order yours. Or I think they might be able to order them here. Thank you. But this is the uh, Peter's projection map. And you can see Africa is much more elongated. Mm -hmm. It's much bigger. Brazil is much bigger. Australia is much bigger. India is much bigger. Europe is much smaller. <laughs> okay? Just, just for you to see the, how big Africa actually is. Okay, now, as we move through this, what, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the basis for what I want to present on. And it's called the scientific method. And this becomes very important to me because I don't want to get caught up in emotion or I don't want to get caught up in saying things that are grandiose without being able to go through a process of helping us understand. I'm, 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 I'm going to give you my short version of what the scientific method is. However, the reason why I show you this is to show you that through the work of Dr. Theophile Obenga, that the, the scientific method came from the walls of Kemet. Mm -hmm. And in the papyri written, the Akmose, which is the Rhine papyrus, and the Moscow papyrus is where the source of what I'm about to talk to you comes from. The scientific method was carved and written in the writings of our ancestors. It didn't happen through Western Asia. It happened in Africa. And on the left side of what you're going to, what I'm going to show you, is the Kemetic legacy. And on the right hand side is where the Greeks did their thing, which comes down to us. The first step in the scientific method. <laughs> is to identify and state the problem and pose the question. That's why after every class I pose the question. What's, what is it that I want you to get? That's, and to our ancestors they called it the Annunciation. This is the science, now this we teach in schools. Mm -hmm. This is the scientific method. Step number two of the scientific method, it, method is to gather information and find the facts from the question that you posed. You'll see here, on the left-hand side is the Meduneta, and on the right-hand side is the Greek. And in Meduneta, Dr. Theophilio Benga says, it's called the setting out, the position of the problem. The third step is, after you've gathered your information and after you've posed your question, you now state a hypothesis. You clearly you, you clearly state what you expect to find out from what the facts tell you and the question that you pose. Our ancestors called it the definition or the specification. The fourth step is to design an experiment that you derive from your hypothesis. You design an experiment to test your hypothesis, to test it. 
to, to, to see if it's real, real. And that's what I try to do, constantly. Because I want to know the truth, not what I hope to be the truth. If it's not, it's not. I can deal with that. Now, the fifth step is a combination in terms of what we teach. But the fifth step, you make observations from your experiment, you record your data, you organize it, and you analyze it. Now, this is all about the Moors. This scientific method I'm telling you now is dealing with the Moors, but specifically in this class, it's dealing with the role that Africa played in the development of human life. That was my question. How, how did it happen? And we're going to go through my experiment, and I'm going to show you how life came from Africa. Because the final step is called the conclusion. And at the end, I think it will be real clear that life as we know it today came from Africa. And every human being on the planet is an African. Make no difference if you are from Albania, or Scotland, or England, or Germany, or Native American. You're an African. Period. So, there is no such thing as an illegal alien. <laughs> and it's going to who you ask in California who the real illegal alien is. <laughs> because remember, California used to be Mexico. called Mexico. Wow. <laughs> no, that's history. That's not personal. And I just wonder, that wall that they want to build, if the Native American had built a wall along the eastern coast, <laughs> we'd be in a lot better position today. They talk about make America great again. <laughs> You know, you know, you know, I, you know, you know. They said to me, "What date would you go to if you wanted to go to make America great?" I told him I would go to August 1492. <laughs> That's when you make America great again before y'all came. Here. <laughs> so okay. That, so that scientific method is in the book. That the one you had on the screen. This right here. Yeah. Then is that in the book? Well, that is my my. Well, see, I I I write curriculum. Oh, you do. And so what you'll what what you'll notice is that this is cut and paste. You see, I come from generation cut and paste. Cut and paste in my generation means scissors and glue. So what I did is that I went into today's science book. This is all science today. This is what we teach in the fifth and sixth grade yeah. about the scientific method. It's been a while, but I remember. Yeah, it's, it's what we teach, right? But I said, okay, let's take what they got, and now let's go to Dr. Dale Valio Benga's work. And let's look at what the Chemites were saying. Okay? And then I said, okay, I'm going to cut and paste. So on the left side, I cut out all of the Kemetic. And on the right side, I had all the Greek. And so what I actually did was type all this out. And then cut and paste this information. You see? Now, what, what if you're interested, uh, I, I can... Um, Put together a packet for you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, as as we go through this, write down some things that you'd like me to make copies of. Okay. okay. And for for whatever nominal fee, I'll just make packets for you. Now, when you look at the story itself. There's a book by uh, Ma'at Monjes. It's, 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 a, it's a book on Kush, where she talks about, um, it's, it, it's called uh, Nubia, the Jewel of Kush, something like that. But it's a book on Kush, and she says, the great civilization of Kemet, ancient Egypt, will remain a mystery until the people and land of, of Kush, Nubia or Sudan, Ethiopia, Puanit, or today's Somalia, uh, are geographically and culturally enjoined and rejoined to the people of the land of Egypt. What 
educators do today is it's called beheading Africa. <clears throat> and they use the Sahara as the cutoff point. That's why you hear a lot of people say south of the Sahara. Because they're trying to disconnect mm -hmm. North Africa from Africa. And so what's important as we go through this, that we look at it through African eyes. Okay? Yeah. This is the Peter's projection map that I showed you. And uh, you can see the one on, on top, that is the Mercator map. And the one on the right is the Peter's projection map. There, 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 there is a big difference. <laughs> and the, the, the Peter's projection map, is, it's called fidelity. F fidelity is how accurate something is. Uh, the Peter's projection map is far more, has far more fidelity than, than the Mercator. Mercator was made on mathematical calculations by Africans, by the way. Our Africans created the Mercator map. The map they use comes from a much more ancient map that, that came from Africa. But Europeans were exposed to these maps through the Moors. And that's why Portugal and Spain are the first on the waters, because they're the ones where the, the Moors are coming out. And the great majority of people on those ships of the Spanish and the Portuguese were black. In fact, there was one ship that was, I'm, I, I forget it was the Pinta Santa Maria or whatever, <laughs> but there was one of them that was owned and operated by twin, or not twin, but two brothers, Pinzone brothers, they were Moors, they were African people. Moors came to America with Cristobal Colon. There is, um, uh, there's a man by the name of Richard Haklut, H-A-K-L-U-Y-T, H-A-K-L-U-Y-T. He wrote the Chronicles, and in the Chronicles, he records that Christopher Columbus says he met Africans returning to Africa when he was coming to America. <laughs> Haklu, Richard Haklu, H-A-K-L-U-Y-T. See, 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 my thing is, you don't have to believe a word I say. That's it. My thing is not to make you believe me, it's just to make you think. And realize that when someone tells a perfect lie, the truth is unbelievable. <laughs> we, we we are experiencing something that is just so untrue, and and it it it, do, it it doesn't allow us to be who we were meant to be, because we don't know who we are. Now I spoke to you before about the center of that hill. This is the Rift Valley. The Rift Valley is a deep crevice in the earth that inside the Rift Valley is the Happy Valley, or the Nile Valley. Inside the Nile Valley is the Nile River, or the Happy River. The Rift Valley starts in Mozambique and travels right up through the east coast of Africa into what we to, under the Red Sea, and into what we today call Israel. And this is the road that the human family is going to take to people the planet. It's a natural road and a natural waterway. Uh, here we go. I need to uh, and here is you're, you're looking at the whole map of Africa and the cutout part of what this became. Okay, so this is the uh, Rift Valley that, that goes straight up. Goes straight up. And it empties into the Red Sea and goes into um, Israel or Palestine or Canaan. Here's the Great Lakes region, the area that we spoke about where the human family was born. This is where the human family is born. Okay? Here is another view of the Peter's projection map and Africa. Now, Africans being born in this area, they're going to start to travel. They're going to start to travel north and they're going to start to travel south. As they travel <coughs> north, 
they're going to veer off west. And this by Dr. Diop is the route that the original Africans took to people the African planet before they people the world. Okay? Now, remember the Rift Valley. Re remember the Hopi or the Nile Valley. Remember the Nile River. This becomes the, the movement of African peoples. From that part that I just showed you, coming straight on up. I'm going to show you this now, but I'll show it to you again later in another class. But this is the Kushite kingdom. When we talk about Kush, this is Kush. Taking in parts of northern Kenya, going up through Ethiopia, Somalia, Djibouti, Eritrea, into Sudan, and then into the southern part of Kemedo, Egypt. Probably as far as Aswan. That's where the, the, the level of technology is going to take its place. And these are the Kushites that are going to eventually move into Kemet and create the first dynasty. Another map of Kush and Kemet, looking at the Hopi uh, Valley. But what it is is that it's turned around the way it should be looking because we, we, we look at the world from a northern perspective. We look at the world like we're going down south, up north. To Kemites, they went down north and up south because of the flow of the river. The Hopi River flows from south to north. A river that has its origin south of the equator flows from south to north. If the origin of the river, like the Mississippi River, is north of the equator, it flows from north to south. And you talk about your directions that basically as it relates to the flow of the river. So we say we're going down south because you're going down the river because the river is flowing down south. But in Kemet, it flows down north. <laughs> and up south. Wow. So what's up in that town? No. It, you know, it's 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 according to your your, your view, your, view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. your perspective. We're living in someone else's world, world view, mm -hmm. yeah. so you can't help but look at stuff that way. Yeah. What other way is there to look at? Right. You know, yes. and and this is what we actually face on a consistent level, and most of the decisions that we make, and like Dr. Diop says, that if you want to, <coughs> if you want to oppress a people, the, there are three things you take from them. You take their history, their language, and their psychological factor, which is your values, your interests, and your principles. And then you superimpose your history, your language, your values, interests, and principles on them. So that no matter what decision you may come to, it will never be in your best interest. That's right. Because it's not wrapped up in your history, your language, your values, interests, or principles. So folk can feel very comfortable living in the Thomas Jefferson houses. <laughs> <laughs> Where you live? Yo, I live in, you know, I live in George Washington, or the, I live in the Morrisania section of the Bronx. Not knowing that Governor Morris came from Barbados with over 300 Africans and settled the Morrisania section of the Bronx and built the Morrisania section of the Bronx. Wow. That's why it's called Morris Park. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> We're very, but, but I don't blame us. Mm -mm. What else do we have? Mm -hmm. When someone tells a perfect lie, the truth is unbelievable. Yes. Please, my sister. Um, is there any indication from your research that uh, people who oriented themselves so closely with the cosmos and with the rising and setting of the sun, that they ever oriented north to the east? Mm. I would say, I'm, 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 I'm going to be careful to answer that question because direction really is arbitrary. North, south, east, and west is really voluntary, okay? Because when, when we look up and we say, I'm, I'm going up to heaven, okay? But when Chinese people do that, they say, I'm going up to heaven, well, that's below us. When you get off the planet, there's no such thing as up and down, north and south. 
so that the orientations would have been on stars that had an impact on the earth. For instance, the three pyramids, the, the, the entrance is on the north. <coughs> and when all three of those pyramids, Khufu, Khafra, and Menkara, all three of those, those entrance ways, if, if you had a telescope looking through from inside the pyramid up into the heavens, they all zero right in on the north star. There was something on top of the pyramids before. It, it's like um, pyramidia. Okay, there was something there to like. I guess it was like a gleam. Or it was black. Or it was like, a oh. black pyramidia. Okay. That that drew and captured light and heat like, energy from the sun. Because <laughs> yeah. mm. oh. a lot of people believe that the pyramids really are nuclear reactors. The pyramids are as deep as they are tall. Mm. The mm -hmm. the pyramids are about three hundred something feet deep. They're 481.4 feet high off the earth, but you also go under, and the way in which it's transfigured, the way in which the underground looks, it looks like a thermal nuclear reactor. So what is it, because I always get confused with this. It's a lot of people who, like if you, when I do my research, sometimes I see that they say the pyramids were gateways to other dimensions, and then that gets debunked by something else. So it's like, I question everything. Yes. I question every single thing. So this is, this leads me to believe when they removed the pyra, how do you say pyramidium. Pyra, pyramidiums off of the top, do you think that could possibly be like the Africans use that to travel? I, I want to be careful answering that because there's so much more research we have to do. Okay. Uh, and also I believe that our ancestors could travel without yeah, using physical that. means. Oh, yeah. yeah. Glad you, you know, said that. You know, I, you know, I believe that you know the mind has the ability to do a lot of phenomenal things. Yes. Uh, but we, but we, we, we are so damaging ourselves. Oh. Again, we're six-dimensional people living in a three-dimensional world. Mm -hmm. And if you don't step up out of that time-space consortium, that time-space ability, continuity, you know, to realize that everything that was yesterday is today and, and is tomorrow, and that you can experience it all in one moment. If, 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 if we don't realize that we are all light, you know, that's why we've got to be careful with light complexion, dark complexion. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about that. It's about being pigmented or being less pigmented. It's not about being light complexion. There is no such thing as light complexion or dark complexion. That doesn't exist. Complexion is not an entity that can be light or dark. That has nothing to do with it. Complexion doesn't exist. You're talking about your epidermis. Mm -hmm. Either it's pigmented or it's not. Period. So... When you say light complexion, dark complexion, black and white, then you say that was a black day in America. Well, what about children to think when they say that I'm a black child? Mm -hmm. If the black day was a bad day, mm -hmm. then a black child must be a bad child. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and if you know if, if white has the the, the content, but there are no white people, you ain't white. You're you're not pigmented. That's what it is. Yes, it goes back to language and your perception of language. And that's why they take it from you to oppress you. Because once they can make you think in another person's perceptual view, then you can see this. Yet the whole while they're telling you that they really honor you. In so many different ways. They tell it to you all the time. When, when, when someone is tanned, they say, oh, don't you look healthy. <laughs> and then you say, well, you know, you look a little pale. I've been sick these past couple of days. <laughs> what are they saying? And we're listening to this, but, but it, because we have interpreted our world from their worldview, we don't really see that they really love to be us mm -hmm. and hate that we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Some of us want to be them. Yes, but that is because, again, that goes from the world view of seeing. But you know something? I see beauty in everything. And I'm not getting caught up in that vampire's bite. You know, I judge people by your spirit. I judge people by the content of your character. Because that's what's important to me. Yes, I. Yes, I. Because there's only one love. That's what they say. See, but we're getting caught up in something. We're getting caught up. And, and because we're angry and because we're upset and because of all that they do, we want to get them back. 
But in getting them back, we're not doing what we have to do for ourselves. Right. Mm. And as long as we focus on them, we can't focus on us. Yeah. That is correct. So, we're, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll exit out of this, and now let's talk about... We're going to deal with, in that area of the human family that's going to be born, Dr. Sheikh Antadia tells us that there are six forms of the human family. The earliest form is called Australopithecus. They're called the Australopithecines. A-U-S-T-R-O-L-O-P-I-T-H-E-C-U-S. Australopithecus robustus. Australopithecus robustus was a, a very robust, the operative word is robust, thick, big, okay, short but thick and big. Now, let me step one step back and let's get real deep inside this because I know a lot of folk are here, okay? Let's work together. Give me a chance to explain. Okay, now I know a lot of us have this thing about coming from apes. Okay, now, science tells us that humanity did not come from apes, mm -hmm. but that humans and apes have a common ancestor. Can we swallow that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Some of us can't, but that's okay. <laughs> the idea is that some people call it Ramapithecus. Lived in the trees. It was part of the day. Mm -hmm. And arboreal life was really very good. That might have been why some of them went down. They might have been kicked out. Because it was too crowded up there because there was a proliferation of apes. A proliferation of the Ramapithecus that was in the tree. So some of them came down. What's gonna happen is there's gonna become a huge drought on the earth and the trees are gonna start to dwindle. When the trees start to dwindle, the, 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 the ones that remained in the trees are not gonna have that great a life. They'll survive, but they're not gonna have that great a life. But the ones that came down on the ground is going to be great for them because everything is now going to be done on the ground. It's going to make them do things that they would not have done up in the trees. Right. For instance, an ape has an opposable big toe. Mm -hmm. It has 100% mobility. It can move through the trees using its hands mm -hmm. and its feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, when this Ramapithecus comes down, that big toe gets in its way when it's walking. So, science tells us that it began to push its big toe up constantly. And over thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, this entity started to be born and give birth where it was no longer opposable. And that it was born with, as we have our big toe. Okay. When that happened, the entity on the ground lost 50% mobility because it couldn't use its feet to grab and whatnot. However, it gained 50% stability because it could now walk better. When it began to walk better, it freed its hands up to start doing things. When it freed its hands up to start doing things, then it looked around its environment and began to use its environment to be able to move forward and do great things. And in doing great things, it made it think better. When it thought better, it ate better. When it ate better, it thought better. And the cycle of life was born in what we call agricultural science. It started to eat better. So Australopithecus robustus, this thick human that was bent over, using its hands sometimes the way they did uh, in the trees, this entity now is going to begin to transform itself. Something that we should take note of today. Mm -hmm. It's not the strongest that survive, and it is not the survival of the fittest. What helps you survive 
is that you can adapt to the new conditions that you're living in. See, we see even sometimes with us, you know, we all want to go. We all want to make America great again. <laughs> That's over. It's a new world. It's it, and only people that can adapt to the fact mm -hmm. that we have other people that live here that are not white males. Until you understand, Islam ain't going nowhere. Peoples of Latino, Latina background ain't going nowhere. Black folk ain't going nowhere. And cockroaches ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> so don't be coming up with no raid two and extra raid and raid three and all that. Thinking you, you get rid of nobody because we're here for good. Right. Cry your river, build your bridge, but get over it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the new world. So that to be able to adapt to your new environment is very important. And I'm saying that to us too. There's a new world out here. And we're going to have to adapt to the new world. And those that can adapt to the new world and, and can function with the least restrictive environment are the ones that are going to survive. Because back then, the Australopithecus robustus, some of them wanted to hang on to the old ways. But there were new ways coming. There were new things happening. And those that could survive, those Australopithecus robustus that could survive, became the second phase of human known as Australopithecus gracile. Gracile, G-R-A-C-I-L-E, is a more graceful, it's a slender Australopithecus. It can move around, it can do things that Robustus couldn't do. It can fit in places Robustus couldn't fit in. It could do things that Robustus couldn't do, so it survived. While all the other Robustus died out, this group of Robustus moved on and became Gracile. Okay? Now, What's interesting is that Gracile, well, like for instance, I like watermelon. I love Zwojan melon. I don't care what anybody say. And I'm proud to love watermelon. You know, if you like water, you're smart. Watermelon is one of the most perfect fruits you can eat. They got everything that you need. But see, they got us so shamed and so afraid to admit that we love Wojan melon. <laughs> I don't care, you know, but it's funny, but okay, we'll leave that alone. You know, the, the idea is um, this Australopithecus robustus, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Gracile, would eat watermelon and it would spit the seed out. And it noticed, I'm, I'm speaking about over hundreds of years now, generations, I'm not speaking about right away, I'm just talking about this group of people, saw that where they spit the seed, a watermelon patch came up. And they say, wow, that's very interesting. There, 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 there must be a continuity to this. There must be some type of spit the seed out from the seed comes. We're not talking about now, how we think now. We're talking about a people who don't have the formation of the neurons that we have today. We're, we're talking about like an infant that is just becoming aware of its environment, okay? And they say, wow, yeah, watermelon. And of course, I'm talking about all fruits in general that have seeds. And it dawned on them, you know, if I should make a hole and put a seed in, it'll cut down the time it takes for the watermelon patch to come up. So started to put holes in the ground and put the seed in. And yeah, it did come. Again, we're talking about the early scientists, the early agriculturalists. And after time, they said, yeah, that works, but my finger hurt. So if I take a stick and put it in the ground, then I can do it that way and I can put seeds. And in fact, my children, Instead of me doing that, I'll have the children put the seeds in and I'll just keep putting holes in the ground, let my family come and put the seeds in and that'll cut down time and I won't have to do everything. Because why, why, why else do I have children? <laughs> so, pretty soon it said, well wait a minute, if I take three sticks, I can make three holes and three seeds can go in. Say, but my back hurts. So if I take the three sticks and attach it to a 
a long stick, then I can just go like this. And then the children can come behind and mm -hmm. fill in the seats. And I say, okay, but wait a minute. Suppose I caught, sort of kind of tip, tip it, and I drag it. I don't have to put holes, I'll just drag it, mm -hmm. and I just, okay, you can see the Orthopithecus gracile is going to think better, it's going to eat better, it's going to eat better, it's going to think better. So Orthopithecus gracile is going to give birth to Homo habilis, mm -hmm. or the human of ability, or the tool maker. Mm -hmm. This is when the human family began to use its environment. You see, economy, echo comes from a Greek word, oikos, O-I-K-O-S. Oikos means environment, like ecology means the study of your environment. Economy doesn't mean money. Mm -hmm. Economy means using your environment to better the society and civilization that you're in. It's not about money. It had nothing to do. Now it's about money, yes. but it has nothing to do with money. It has to do with your environment and how you can utilize your environment to better the civilization that you're living in. Homo habilis, human of ability. It's going to start to eat better. It's going to start to think better. It's going to eat better. And what's happening in the brain? is that, you know, when you think or when you study real hard and you start getting the headaches, mm -hmm. well, you know, it feels like that, you know, boy, your brain is a muscle. Mm -hmm. And when you think, you're actually flexing, you're exercising. Mm -hmm. They have found that people who are geniuses don't have big brains. What they have is dense brains. The nooks and crannies of your brain are deep. Mm -hmm. Because when you think, what you're actually doing is you're making those crevices get deeper and deeper and deeper mm -hmm. and it's becoming denser. But when it became denser in the early human being, it began to push this slanted forehead forward. It pushed it forward and forward and forward, and pretty soon we now have foreheads. But our early ancestors had a slant, like, like apes and gorillas do. They, they have a slanted forehead. But you have a part in your brain, you have three parts to your brain. You have your brain stem, you have your limbic system, and then you have what's called your neocortex. Your, your, uh, your brain stem or your R complex, your reptilian brain, is your, is your oldest brain. From that part of your brain grew the limbic system. From that part of your brain grew the neocortex. Now, your brain looked like a mushroom, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay? In your limbic system, you have a particular area that's known as your ventricular system. You have four ventricles. You have two lateral ventricles that looks like bird's wings. Okay, look something like this. Your, your lateral ventricles are joined by a third ventricle. Your third ventricle then has a fourth ventricle. Okay. Now, what's going to happen with Homo habilis as he and she lives their life and growing and developing and phenomenal things are happening? When, when they walk, they, they walked hunched over. Okay, which creates cataracts or interruptions in the flow of your liquid systems. Because if, if, if I'm like this, there's an interruption in my blood. Because it, it has to go past here, has to go past here. And in your brain, you have an opening at the base of your brain known as the foramen magnum. L let me stick a pin here for a minute. Because this is why I'm saying to us as a family, we have to study. Mm -hmm. Science and math. We really do. Because if we're going to make this happen, if we're really going to do this, it's not about coming to a lecture. It, it really isn't. And, and I know that for some who are in the early stages of this that, that need a lecture, but this six-part series wasn't set up as a lecture series. It was a workshop series. It's a shop where we're going to work. <laughs> Because this is about brain anatomy. This is about studying the brain and how you function. Because when we understand this, we can turn this whole thing around. And then we can turn our children around. Mm -hmm. But like when you're on an airplane and they say if there's an accident and that, that mask comes down, put it on you first. Because what good is it if you put it on the child and you suffocate? We have to get ourselves together before we can go into our community and do what's necessary there. So that these things that I'm saying to you right now is what I taught my fifth grade students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm my sixth grade students when I was teaching them science and brain anatomy. These were, the but I taught them in perception of what they needed to know and why they needed to know this. 
because when you're sitting down, you have, you have created uh, 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 you you have created cataracts. Okay, but what's important is the flow of your liquid systems as you're sitting down. Right. When you're standing up, the same is true. So that when this Homo habilis was bent over, the foramen magnum, F-O-R-A-M-E-N, foramen magnum, M-A-G-N-U-M, this foramen magnum in the base of the neck, when, when they were orthograde, looking this way, like that, the, the spinal cord pressed up against the foramen magnum, mm -hmm. which interrupted the flow of cerebrospinal fluid and blood. Mm -hmm. However, Homo habilis is going to start to stand up, erect. What's going to happen when Homo habilis starts to stand up erect? There are going to be some that don't stand up erect, and there are going to be some that do stand up erect. The ones that are going to stand up erect, the foramen magnum, is the spinal cord is not going to be interrupted by the foramen magnum. But also, in standing up and pushing this forehead out, what's going to happen is that the lateral ventricles are going to open up because the ventricles are like balloons. Mm -hmm. And in the foramen magnum, you have bundles of tissues known as choroid plexus. C-H-O-R-O-I-D-P-L-E-X-U-S. Choroid plexus. Every one of your ventricles has bundles of tissues that produce cerebrospinal fluid. So that when this human stands up, Homo habilis stands up, there comes a free flow of the liquid systems of the body. Think of it like this. You, 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 you have a hose. You have it bent. You turn the water on. How's the water going to come out the hose? Spurts. Because it has to go... The bend. What happens when you turn it flat? Uh, up? There's a free flow. This is what's going to happen to cerebrospinal fluid, which has 13 times the amount of melanin that bathes your nervous system. So, Homo habilis, the tool maker, in standing erect, when you're walking like this, what's on your mind? What's in front of you? But when you stand up like this, that started future thinking. That started looking out and seeing where you were going not where you were. <coughs> so that this human starts to think totally different and Homo habilis is going to become Homo erectus. Mm -hmm. The operative word is erect. Mm -hmm. Standing up erect. Mm -hmm. This is the first evidence that we have of life outside of Africa. Orthopithecus robustus, Orthopithecus gracile, and Homo habilis can only be found in Africa by millions of years. <clears throat> then you have Homo erectus, the first form, coming out of Africa and going into places like Saudi Arabia. First time we see anybody out of Africa is Homo erectus. Please, brother. So Ramapithecus <coughs> is just coming down from the tree? Ram Ramapithecus is a common ancestor between the ape and human. It's a common ancestor. It is neither an ape nor a human. It's a very early form of what would be considered primate. Some people don't call it Ramapithecus. Some say the name isn't Ramapithecus. I don't care what we call it. What I'm saying is that there is a common ancestor because no matter what we may feel about the ape, 99.9% .9 bone for bone, muscle for muscle, apes and humans are the same. That's just biology. There is a connection. Homo erectus, in doing what it's going to do, and it's going to be in Africa that it's going to happen, is going to start to get the three gifts that were given to the human. You know, we as humans have to be very careful because we have no specialty. Dogs have smell. Yes. Birds have sight. Cats have agility. Humans don't have a specialty. But we have gifts. Very unique gifts that were given to us by chance. It, it wasn't even, you know, and when I say by chance, of course I believe it's in the divine order of things. Mm -hmm. We have intellect, reason, 
the ability to reason and language. We have the ability to critically think, reason what we're thinking, and be able to express in language what we reasoned that we thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is what puts us as the masterpiece of the cosmic universe. Mm -hmm. And there is life out there. But that life out there, number one, is going to be black. Mm -hmm. Because carbon is the unifying factor of what life is. Yeah. But also, it's going to look just like us, which certain changes possible, possibly because of its environment. But basically, it's going to be structured pretty much like us. Who, who, why do you say that? Because of the nature of, of the repetition of what we see happening. Mm -hmm. Like, you, like you're not going to have no reptile-headed people. <laughs> you know, you're not going to have things that don't look a certain way. There's a certain function in the cosmic universe that creates what might be considered a perfect creation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is something that that is an entity that comes in Trinity: mm -hmm. a head, a body to function, and legs to take it where it got to go. Mm -hmm. These are basic things that now you might see many different forms of life, mm -hmm. but as it relates to a critical thinking, because I'm gonna tell you something: we are not the most intelligent people around. <coughs> do you do you know what's the most intelligent? that can do more things than we can do? Dolphins. Mm. Mm. Dolphins are, dolphins underwater, there's a lot they can do that we can't do. But there's a lot that we can do that they can't do. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at life forms, what I'm saying is that the entities that would be us mm -hmm. will look like us. Some may be very much taller than us, some could even be giants, right. mm -hmm. to, to our standard. Mm -hmm. And others can be very small. That's how we started on the planet. You know, when elephants were first on the planet, you know, they, was, they, they, they were about the size of a chihuahua. Elephants weren't born that big. They became <laughs> that big. When humans were first born, they basically were the size of little monkeys today. As Not the humans I'm talking about now. I'm talking about the Ramapithecus and going back in time. Mm -hmm. Because if you go back in time, before we were mammals, we were reptiles. Before we were reptiles, we were fish. And before we were fish, we were in the water. That's why when you look in the corner of your eye and you see that little ball, that's, that used to be what we would pull across our eye when we were in the water. But when we came out the water, we don't use it anymore, so it started to go in and in and in. You'll notice some people have very big balls in the corner of their eye. That used to be the skin that used to come across your eye when we were in the water. Same, same thing with your coccyx bone, your tailbone. Mm -hmm. That's a remnant of our tail. Now I know people don't have, you know, people have serious issues. Yeah, people walk out when I start talking like this. But, 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 but you know, I'm going to take you to Congo land in the Bronx Zoo. Because when I went to Congo land in Bronx Zoo, right, they, they, you know, I, you know psst, psst. I looked over, this gorilla was calling me over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gorilla. <laughs> this gorilla said, yo, brother, we like you. <laughs> we watch your DVD. <laughs> but they said, we want you to deliver a message to people. Mm -hmm. And that message is, what make you think we want to be connected to y'all? Mm -hmm. Look at how y'all act. Right. We peaceful up in here. We ain't had a fight since 1944. <laughs> Nobody fight up in here. They're peaceful. They help each other. They may try to f prove their, their, their personhood every so often. But gorillas told me, they say, you know, we ain't proud of y'all. We don't want to be associated with y'all. And you, you know, you co you know, y'all come here, you looking at us and you laugh at us. But guess what? Who really is in prison here? It's all according to what side of these gates you're on. Because these folk bring us food every day. <laughs> and we don't ever have to worry about Obamacare. <laughs> we got our own medical service. That veterinarian right there, watch this. He, he called him over. He said, fix this. And then he, we defecate. They come clean this stuff up. <laughs> so, 
you know, I, I say this, you know, sometimes I can extend the story out, <laughs> and sometimes I make it short. But you know, the point that I'm making is the fact that we are part of nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are part of nature, and you can see a beautiful story. When people talk about, are you a creationist or are you a evolutionist, I say I'm a creative evolutionary. Mm -hmm. Because that which the creator can create can evolve into what it becomes. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, it takes time for us because I know we've all grown up with views towards apes and views towards gorilla, but they are quite a phenomenal group yes, of people. They, are. they really are phenomenal when you understand how they live. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I, I got exposed to apes by a, a series of programs I did. When I was doing this work, I decided that I was going to order some books on, on, on the great apes. Okay? Because the great apes, there's only one place that you want to find apes, and that's in the Virunga Mountains. Of, of, of Rwanda and Uganda, mm. the, the Virunga Mountains, V-I-R-U-N, Virunga, G-A, Virunga. Mm. That is where all apes come from. And then, Virunga, V-I-R-U-N-G-A, located in um, uh, Rwanda uh, and uh, Uganda, all up in that area, okay? You have mountains up there. Just like you have mountains of the moon where the humans came from, mm -hmm. you have mountains of Virunga. Mm -hmm. And you have the ones that stayed up in the mountains, and they became the mountain gorilla, or the silverback. Mm -hmm. And then that same group, some went west, they became the western lowland, lowland, and then you had the eastern lowland that went east. They left the same way humans left, gorillas left the same exact way. Virunga Mountains. Mm -hmm. This is science. Mm -hmm. This is nature. Mm -hmm. I love where I came from. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why they, 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 they call me when I go to the Congo in Bronx Zoo. Mm -hmm. Because they like me. Mm -hmm. Because I like them. <laughs> <laughs> but I know it's, it's a bit of pill sometimes. It, it's something that we that we have to continue to, to grow with. Mm -hmm. and I ask nobody don't believe anything I say look look at the science of it S study about the apes get books on the apes you know um, uh, Google them on on YouTube and, and stories will come to you and and you'll see and go to Virunga uh, Avery Avery Brooks the brother um, the actor did a three-part series for PBS on the apes <coughs> phenomenal three-part series and in fact, I'm trying to figure out where it is. But you'll find out a lot of interesting things about apes and about gorillas and about their relationships with us. Bone for bone, muscle for muscle, we're the same. The only place you're going to find differences is in the limbic system of the brain. Chances are in the locus coeruleus. You're going to see more melanin in the brain of humans than in uh, gorillas. They're going to start to think, and Homo sapiens is going to become Homo sapiens sapiens. Mm -hmm. Homo sapien means thinking human. Homo sapiens sapiens means creative thinking human. Mm -hmm. That's the one at the last 10 seconds of the last minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's Homo <laughs> sapiens sapiens. Please, brother. So from Homo erectus, we go to Homo sapiens. From, from Homo erectus, you go to Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there's an S on the end of sapiens. Sapiens, which means thinking. And then from Homo sapiens, we go to Homo sapiens sapiens. But now let me just drop this on you, and we'll stop there, because I just want to uh, say it and then leave it. My research tells me that there were Africans, probably somewhere around the end of the dynastic period of Kemet going into Kush in that area that had moved out of Homo sapiens sapiens mm -hmm. and moved into a category that I call the super sapiens mm -hmm. and it was based in a understanding of spirituality They, they, they understood, when, when we talk about space travel, uh, mind travel, they had mastered 
and they were able to do things with their minds like when we as homo sapiens sapiens look at Australopithecus super sapiens and you see, see how we figure how let's say primitive they were super sapiens look that way about us that we're primitive because they were at such a level they had gone into the cosmic reality they, 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 the whole concept of your chakras and mm -hmm. your meditation, yeah. they had all gotten themselves to a point where they were so deep in the cosmos, they went back from whence they came. Mm. I, was just wow. to, I was just about to ask that question. When you're saying going deep into the cosmos or going to the cosmos or take yourself there, if that was meditation, that helped get them there. Meditation, higher levels of meditation. Higher levels of meditation that when we meditate, we're really, it's like taking the first step in a thousand step journey. Mm -hmm. This, you know, what we do in meditation, nothing compared to what our ancestors could do. And that's where mm -hmm. prayer came from. Yeah. Because they did it in groups after a while. So and they, they all started taking off together. So they became, they, they do it deeper than how we do it now. Yes. And, and, and when I say deeper, it's not so much the, we have the potential to do that. Right. We just got too much block in us. Right. Right. We have the same potential they have. There's nothing, just like, just like, Orsula, it's, it's just like the seed becomes the oak tree. Everything that the oak tree will ever be is in the seed. That's right. And everything the seed is, is the oak tree. We're the same exact way. Everything that is great, we have. We have to unlock those doors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I turn off all these lights in here. You can see nothing. All of a sudden, the light goes on. You can see the, uh, the pictures, the table, the, the, uh, the microphones, each other. The question becomes, did all those things appear in the room when you turned the light on? No, they were already no, there. No, they were always there. Your light will know. Right. And so what I'm saying is that the potential of the human body, the, 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 the potential of the mm -hmm. human brain is beyond our understanding, but you have to unlock it. Mm -hmm. We've been locked by the intrusion of white supremacy. That's yes. right. And let me tell you something else so that you can understand this. Let me give you a quote by Napoleon. My decision to destroy the authority of the blacks in San Domingue, or Haiti, is not so much based on considerations of commerce and money as on the need to block forever the march of the blacks in the world. Mm -hmm. When Napoleon went to Egypt in 1798, mm -hmm. and he saw the Sphinx, mm -hmm. and he saw all that... He realized the very people we are enslaving are the masters of the arts and sciences right. that we are copying. Right. Mm -hmm. He said, we can't let that happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they set up this, this constant block in our mind. Because mm -hmm. if you ever unlock your mind, mm -hmm. you the, it, the sky is not the limit. No, right. That's true. That's true. And our children, oh. be around them for a while. See, I'm a kindergarten teacher. Them five-year-olds, they, they drop stuff on me that I say, Ooh, <laughs> I always say to them, what made you think that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was the origin of that thought? Mm -hmm. Because that's where you get the core to genius. Mm -hmm. It's not what you think, it's what brought you to that thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to have, start to have a dialogue with our children to try to figure out, whoa, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's the voice of the ancestors. Mm -hmm. That's the voice of, of and, and a lot of times they say, I don't know. I say, oh no, you know, but we just gotta figure out. Now, if, if we could get them to know, then that would open up the whole thing for us. They could help us open it. So, those are the six forms of the human as it relates to understanding the development of the human being. Now, this is what's going to be important. At some point in time on the earth, see 
Maybe it won't be that bad. Oh, that's not bad. Our Earth, above the 51st parallel, which basically cuts Europe in half, this is the zone that Dr. Diop tells us. This is the zone. This is Ireland. This is England. Uh, this is uh, the Netherlands or Holland. It, it, it goes across Europe. It creates a polar cap around our planet. It even comes across into the United States, the northern part of the United States. This is going to be uh, the boundaries of habitable Europe during the warm glacial period. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you that other piece. Because on our planet, there were four ice ages. The first ice age was known as the Gunz, G-U-N-Z. In, in the American hemisphere, the way in which we judge and we name the ice age is according to where, what state it came down to. So while there was the Gunz in Europe, it was known as the Nebraskan in the United States because the boulders, the ice boulders came down as far as Nebraska. There was an interstadial period. So basically they say it was 1.75 million years ago. It's a man by the name of Louis Agassiz. L-O-U-I-S A-G-A-Z-Z-I-Z. -Z -Z -Z, Louis Agassiz. He's the one that came up with this concept of the ice ages. About 1.75 million years ago, the gun starts but by 600,000 years ago, it goes into a warming trend. Then, about 75,000 years later, the second ice age comes. It's called the Mindel, M-I-N-D-E-L. About 350,000 years ago, begins the next warming trend. It's called the interstadial. The third ice age is going to come, and it's called the RIS. In, in, in Europe, it's called the RIS. In America, it's called the Illinoisan, because the boulders come down as far as the state we call Illinois today. There's going to be a, um, that's going to last, give or take 230,000. I, I don't get too caught up in dates. Uh, the, the dates are going to change. But what's important is, the next ice age, the, the fourth ice age, is the ice age that concerns us as humans because that's when Africans have found their way up into Europe, mm -hmm. beyond the 51st parallel. And it's going to be during about 50,000 years ago, there's going to be a warming trend. These Africans are going to, please, Gus. Excuse me, what's the uh, fourth one is? Worm, W-U-R-M, worm glaciation. And it's going to freeze, and then there's going to be an interstadial. During this interstadial, about 50,000 years ago, is when human beings, Africans, are going to get into Europe. Now, they're getting in during an interstadial, so they don't know what's about to come. And all of a sudden, worm part two comes, and they're locked into these caves. They're locked. Because if you look at the northern fringe, you'll notice there's a lot of mountains. It becomes ice mountains. So what these Africans have to do is retreat into caves. And they're going to put clothes on. Because isn't that what we did? Because when I spoke in the summertime here, we weren't dressed like this. No. <laughs> and a lot of us wish we could have gone outside to have class. But right now, we're happy we're here, and we bundled up. Okay, and we're losing our pigmentation. The complexion we were in August is not the complexion we are now in January. Okay? Now, just a couple of isolated things I want to talk to you about. Because here is a student of mine, a phenomenal student, Caitlin Lopez. 
she was a student of mine in New Paltz, she was interested in doing something on hair. Mm -hmm. And this talks about how did the hair become kinky, the texture of the hair, and how did it become straight. Mm -hmm. And so what Caitlin did, I know she'd be happy I'm using her work, mm -hmm. is she looked at a picture, in fact I can get a better picture for you. This was her lesson plan that she developed, that she taught, okay. <coughs> Okay, what you're looking at there is the epidermis of the skin on top and the hair follicle. In your sebaceous gland, you have little bundles, little packets of sebum, S-E-B-U-M, sebum. When needed, that packet bursts and sends the oily, waxy substance to the scalp, to the skin, because you have hair all over your body. In the heat of Africa, in the heat of Africa, in the early human beings, that oil covers the head and protects the head from the harmful rays of the sun. It connects itself to the hair shaft, and it makes it elliptical in shape. It kinks it. Okay. As the human moved away from the sun and the heat of Africa and moved into Europe and then impacted by the Ice Age, the sebum that was sent to the scalp did not need to be cooked away. It stayed on the hair shaft and made the hair straight. Mm -hmm. That's what straight hair is. Mm -hmm. In fact, when hair is real straight, so straight, what do we call it? Dead straight. Because what has actually happened is that the oily, waxy substance has suffocated the protein in the hair. Again, it's not about good hair or bad hair. It's about science and what the sebum in the scalp created in order to protect the scalp from the harmful rays of the sun. In the cold climate, it's allowed to produce itself and it rests itself on the hair and it makes the hair straight. Now variations of that go from very kinky, very nappy, to wavy, and then uh, uh, degrees of wave, and then straight, and then degrees of straight. And it's according to where you find yourself on the planet, you can actually see. And then when you get into the northern climate, not only that, but the melanin is stripped from the hair, and that is where you start to get brown hair, light brown hair, blonde hair, and then platinum. That is where the eyes go from black to brown mm -hmm. to green to blue to hazel to pink. Not super gray. Not super, yeah, gray is there too. Not superior, not inferior. It's just science. Mm -hmm. But it does beg the question, why would you want to turn your brown eyes blue? Mm. Why would you volunteer mm. to become recessive? Mm. Ain't nothing wrong with blue eyes now, please understand. Mm. I see beautiful eyes in all colors. Mm. What I'm saying is that the mindset that has made us see other people as beautiful and us as ugly to the point that we want to become like them, even if it's to give up our dominance to become recessive. Mm -hmm. Because we don't know anybody. And they, they want to be us. like black folk. Yeah. Why? Because somebody making money. Yeah. <laughs> no, think about what I'm saying. Everything that they do. <coughs> Tanning parlors. Mm -hmm. Cosmetic surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, Indian hair. I saw a commercial on Indian hair the other day. Authentic Indian hair. Twelve hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but that's where we are. So this is how very curly hair became very straight. Science has nothing to do with good or bad. 
In fact, if that head did not do what it did, it would not be able, be able to survive mm -hmm. in the cold climate. Mm -hmm. So nature loved the uh, the person so much it that it made it. sure that it gave to that person the, the wherewithal. Now, with that same concept, what's, what's important to understand is that as it relates to the complexion, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this now. If you go to um, kabakamene.com, K-A-B-A, K-A-M-E-N-E.com, I have um, a free e-course on my next book, Spirituality Before Religions. And this information can come down to you also. Thank you. But what I want to show you <coughs> is another thing uh, that you have to realize about the humans is that we had hair. As we developed into the human, hair acts as a heat loss system in the body. But when we started to lose our hair, what the human, what, what happened with the human by nature is that there be, be, began to develop other glands like the apocrine and the eccrine glands were developed in the skin in order to be a heat loss system for the human being. As the, as the hair of the body began to lose, there's an article by Nina Jablonski. In fact, she has a book called Skin, too. But it's called The Naked Truth, Why Humans Have No Fur and How Evolving Bare Skin Led to Big Brain. But the evolving of the big brain that led to bare skin also led to... Because if you look at a gorilla, mm -hmm. You know, that's why, you know, they got to be careful what they say because if you shaved a gorilla, the gorilla would look more like Rush Limbaugh than me. <laughs> because, a pale, uh, because a gorilla under the hair is pale. It's pale. But it's the blackness of the hair that allows the skin to be pale. Where a, where a gorilla is black is up here, and that's because there's no hair. And that's the melanin in the face that, that makes it black. See, this is all science. This is why that person from outer space that comes down and sees us, they say, but don't they know their history? Mm -hmm. what, what, you know, why are they making this complexion and all the wide nose and thick lip and hair texture so important to the value of the person? I don't understand this. Mm -hmm. Particularly if they, if they knew where they came from. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's why they do what they do. It's called, divine proje it's, it's called dynamic projection in psychology. When you project on someone else, your own insecurity and inferiority. Mm -hmm. So, so, so really when they in their own mind are saying how ugly your skin is or your hair is or whatever, they're really wishing they had it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Like when children say, oh, that ain't nothing and they just want to have it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's the name of that book skin? It's called Skin by, by Nina Jablonski. J-A-B-L-O-N-S-K-I. Nina Jablonski. Uh, it, but, it, but if you go to uh, National Geographic, she, she has a nice little... Uh, uh, Scientific America, February 2010. She has an article called The Naked Truth. Scientific America. February 2010. Uh, and again, uh, uh, something else important is the laws of pigmentation, body mass, and measurement. You have Glosier's Law that deals with uh, pigmentation that says for life to come out, it has to be in a tropical climate. Mm -hmm. And that's evidence right here. In the summertime, we get darker, and in the wintertime, we get lighter. Now, if you can imagine this human organism in the ice for thousands of years, what would happen to that organism? You know, it, 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 it would naturally, in, in, in order to survive, it would do that. Allen's Law deals with the, with the idea of um, limb size the sizes of the limbs, and Bergman's law uh, deals with body mass. And all three of those factors determine what makes a human look the way a human looks. From physiology to morphology. And basically it has to do with science. And that's why life came from Africa. Because of the nature of life coming out of heat. It doesn't come from the cold. Look outside. Everything dead. 
Summertime, springtime, green plants. Everything grow. Science. It's not personal. saying how when the Africans migrated into the, the cold, that's why their nose were um, elongated. Mm -hmm. And that's why the hair just came down. And the, like and you said earlier, the eyes were yes. mm -hmm. lighter too. Yes. And it just made so much sense to me. Oh, yeah. It's all science. And, <laughs> and, 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 and Dr. Diop is the perfect person, mm -hmm. you know, to, to study and to understand these concepts. Uh, this, oh, oh, here it is. Okay. What, what I'm trying to get at is something known as 7 dehydrocholesterol. 7 dehydrocholesterol. People tell you that.